Good morning, everybody. So we'll kickstart the session. Thanks to everybody for coming in so early, especially after the gala dinner yesterday. So we have a list of topics and a galaxy of stars who are going to speak on them. Uh, but there's a keynote. So we'll uh, start with the keynote first. So I'll just introduce Dr. Shiraj, who is going to give us the keynote lecture on Portion Saltman Syndrome. So Dr. Siraj is the departmental head and the consultant ophthalmologist at a 333-bedded Ministry of Health hospital in Brunei. He assumes the responsibility of the OPD inpatient surgical and trauma care services of his department. So you can see that uh, there's Brunei, which is marked on the map. Can I have a pointer, please? And you can see that uh, the Malaysian uh, peninsula is jutting in. Indonesia is all around. And it's a very small place. But when I looked up this place, it's amazingly beautiful. And the facilities which the government provides uh, in terms of healthcare benefits and et cetera is just amazing. So I'm sure that uh, we are going to learn a lot from Dr. Shiraj when he mentions about uh, his, his, the facilities in his talk also. So Sir has over 28 years experience in OFTA and he has acquired a varied exposure in the different subspecialties of ophthalmology, not only in Brunei, but in India, the Middle East, Maldives, and Singapore. His special interest is comprehensive ophthalmology and medical education. As you can see from the pictures, that it's just a beautiful place. Apart from that, the picture in the background, which I've Googled, I, sir can correct me if I'm wrong. So he's part of the invited academic faculty to the University of Brunei Darussalam, which you can see in the background. And he balances his current administrative and clinical roles with research and academics by teaching the medical undergraduate and postgraduate students and nurses. He has co-authored chapters and textbooks of Ofta, apart from being the co-author and author of many original research publications in local and international journals. He is also a peer reviewer of international and local journals. By inspiring and leading his doctor allied technician nursing team, he has initiated many innovative patient-friendly programs towards preventive eye care in his hospital. And he actively takes part in the ministry's community of ophthalmology initiatives. So that's all with the introduction. I leave the floor to Dr. Shiraj. Sir, please. Good morning, uh, respected uh, friends and respected colleagues. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and for the kind words, Dr. Arijit. It's very nice of you to have done so much of research. I can see how much research oriented you've been my already. Pleasure, my pleasure. <laughs> okay. So I have no financial disclosures in this talk. I, I start by paying respects to my teachers uh, before I proceed more into this topic. So to, this will be probably the overview by which I, I propose to lay my talk. Why controversies? Why should we have a controversy actually? Healthy controversies are good because they stimulate change and leads to improvements and benefits mankind. So assuming that we're gonna have a healthy controversial discussion today, why should we choose glaucoma? Glaucoma, as you know, has a multivariate etiology, multiple variables for which IOP is only controllable uh, factor. It varies spectrum of presentations. And do we, it's very subtle, most of the patients we miss. And it can progress in spite of what we think we are treating. Of course, we try to do the best for the patients, but always it doesn't work. And is there a cure? Well, as of now, no. So probably glaucoma is a good uh, topic for a controversial discussion in a positive way. So that's why we are all here, to get some positive insights into how we can make this condition better. So to kick start the session, I, dis I, pr I propose to start with the topic of type of glaucoma, which is controversial, is it a uveitis or is it a glaucoma as such? What is the cause? Is it progressive? And how do you treat it? Do you treat it at all or do you wait? And finally, is this a good guy or a bad guy? So I'm talking about Poshner Schlossman syndrome, which was initially reported in 1948 with a small series of nine cases. And as acute unilateral recurrent attacks with increased IOP and mild AC inflammation. So they propose that we can just wait and watch in between episodes and treat only when the problem happens. So this is the spectrum by which the initial report came up. 
and they mentioned that there is no in, in between the attacks that is one of the main criteria the incidence came out only by a Finland study and it's the incidence is actually supposed to be very low but the etiology is quite unknown most of the proposed theories mention that either they are non-infective like autonomic dysregulation or allergy or developmental or vascular and some even consider autoimmune this is the original uh, proposed uh, etiology by uh, Mr. Postal Strassman himself and they found this got associated to migraine so they propose the autonomic dysregulation theory which is also supported by the fact that when you do an uh, iris angiogram there are some ischemic focal areas which are seen during the attack periods there was another theory proposed based on eczema as glaucoma allergicum which is fell out of place similarly some people noted angle abnormalities again fell out of place and of course vascular endothelial theory is another theory which is invoked because of the ischemia and also in addition has uh, optic nerve ischemia. So probably that is a more contributing to the damage which is happening apart from autoimmune prostaglandins and the HLA theories. Autoimmune, they found one autoimmune HLA factor protective and one having an association. Infective theory is taking, picking up now. There have been interesting studies to mention about H. pylori and viruses. It's been found that anti-H pylori IgG has been found and demonstrated. Is there a cross reaction between the antigens in the intestinal mucosa versus the trabecular meshwork? Well, that's what they think. HSV, again, slowly falling out of place because they found that it's not really uh, matchable and reproducible. And they have uh, CMV, they have found uh, active anti-CMV antibody productions. And Singaporean cohort study has supported this and they say that specific CME specific antivirals are working. But then again, we have to see is it because of the disease itself which automatically relapses or is it because of the antiviral therapy which is helping it to prevent it from coming back. So this is how the etiology is more confused, some infective or non-infective theories. Is there any controversy in pathology? Yes, during pathology again, during the episodes, there, were no, there, was, there was only one biopsy proven uh, thing where it, during a trabeculectomy they took a, they took a sample and they found monocytes with long pseudopods getting into the trabecular measure. So why are they there? How does it happen? Again, is still not known yet. The laterality and blurred vision, elevated IOPs with no PA as a characteristic features and has variable amount of recurrences and optic nerve cupping and is reversible during those episodes and the pupil being slightly sluggish and iris atrophy is not really actually taken as a main characteristic finding anymore. So remember, Postler Schlossman is a very great mimicker. So what are the things this can mimic and what are the conditions which can be missed as this one? Angle closure glaucoma because there can be severe acute increase in pressure but however when you do a gonioscopy the angles are open here. Chronic angle closure again the gonioscopy is going to disprove this. Open angle glaucoma is because the eyes are very white. Is it because of that? Well, the intraocular pressure for open angle is going to be persistent. There is definitely structural damage in POAG. Is it ocular hypertension then? Well, the persistent of IUP in ocular hypertension is what is against this condition. And of course, there are no spikes in ocular hypertension. Uveitis, possible? Possible, probably because of inflammation, but here there is no PS and the intraocular pressure is not as high in uveitis like how it happens here. Herpetic, of course, we don't have skin lesions, we don't have the stellate KPs. And Fuchs is one thing which has always been spoken of as a close mimicker. But again, hydrochromia, Amsler sign, cataract associations are not there in this condition. So we have a lot of conditions which look just like these, but we have to probably pick up the right one. What investigations do you do then? There is no specific investigations. There are some mainly clinical. However, we can do an iris angiogram, which is found uh, to have ischemia and optic nerve fluorometry showing polar ischemia as well. We can do HRT cup volume assessment which changes with, between the attacks and not. However, the visual fields in some cases have been found to be progressive. So you should remember that we have to still do a fields for cases where we suspect its attacks are very often. Laboratories, well, herpes. And frequent attacks can lead to, so remember it mimics POAG and N, uh, non arthritic A or N also can be towards that. So we have two conditions which are going very close to each other. Well, so what are the treatment aims of these conditions? One is to reduce intraocular pressure and reduce inflammation, only two baselines. So how do you do that? With glaucoma medications, a word of caution, we should avoid uh, pilocarpin in these cases. Steroids are given, but usually for a shot, because you should watch for steroid-induced rise in intraocular pressure on long term. 
Prostate gland-in blockers, like NSA, AEDs, have been found to be useful as well. Non-calcitrant cases uh, need filtration surgery. However, unlike other filtration cases, we should still get these people back to us because they can still have periodic attacks of uh, prostate happening after the surgery. So, coming back to treatment, is there any controversy on that? Well, are we doing enough for these patients? By treating them, is it enough or not? Uh, is it just enough to treat the exacerbations or do we have to monitor this patient? Is it benign or not? So remember that we, the problem in this condition is the duration of the IOP spike more than the frequency. So the main treatment aim here should be to abort the attack as quickly as you can. So that is the take home message. If you have postural slossman, we should teach the patients to abort the attack as quickly as they can so the damage doesn't happen. The gray zones, we do not know still how this happens. Why does it progress? And why only some people become worse? What do you do and how often do you follow up these conditions? Do we give a role for baseline medications, knowing that it's like giving a voltage stabilizer to a gadget? Are you going to put them on baseline timolol? So the attack happens, the attack is not as bad as before. Is there a role for attack aborting? There are some centers who give the patient who knows the condition tablet uh, acetazolamide, who pops the tablet when he knows he's getting the attack before they come over to the center, especially on a holiday. So we abort the attack, make the attack less subtle. However, we don't depend on the patient to decide. He still comes back to you on the next working day for you to confirm if the problem is there or not. So what have you done? You aborted the attack. Number two, the patient should be well aware of what's happening. And is there a baseline medications? Is there any neuroprotection? Because we know there are vascular factors involved. These are some controversial and something that we can think about. Antivirals, are we going to treat them with anti H, H pylori for these cases? Again, we have to watch and see what things happen. So we let's watch for, is there a future for this condition? Now that we know how this is, and we know this is a bad guy, it's not really a very good guy, we have to be watchful enough, so when we are careful and educate our patients, we can still put this bad guy behind bars. So that's what we have to think about and keep that in our mind when we do it. So the take home points again, for this particular session under Dr. Arijit, will be that uh, damage is preventable, number one. Whack your minds, keep an open mind, be a lateral thinker, be curious to look for subtle findings. Always clinical, clinical, clinical is most important, especially this one. Do not be afraid to try or embrace new concepts. If there are any concepts coming up in the session, think about it and learn new techniques and be thirsty for new knowledge. So with that, I think I can set the table for the session now. Uh, in this session, we have a right blend of experts here who's going to be here. Uh, we have Manish Singh, we have Arijit Mitra, the main man, the captain of the team. Uh, Dr. Deepanjan Pai, Dr. Sagar Bhargava, and Sujat Dasar. So I invite you and let the battle begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was a wonderful talk. But you've opened a Pandora's box. The session itself is on controversies. So before I start the discussion, I'd like to call all the other speakers on stage so that you know, they can uh, express their views. So I'd like to call on Dr. Manish Singh on stage, not uh, uh, to start the talk senior cataract and glaucoma consultant at BBI Foundation in Kolkata. Dr. Deepanjan Pal, senior cataract and glaucoma consultant, Disha Eye Hospitals. Dr. Sagar Bhargava, senior anterior segment and glaucoma consultant from BBI Foundation, Kolkata. And last but not the least, Dr. Shuchanda Shor, our ma'am, our teacher, senior cataract and glaucoma consultant from Disha Eye Hospitals. Please, could you all join us on stage? So, uh, any questions for uh, Dr. Azim? Any any questions regarding Bosner Scholzmans? Because we've all been confused because sometimes it attacks one eye persistently in that particular eye, or sometimes it just switches between the two eyes. So I, I just want to ask a question, sir, because you've raised the antiviral and the H. pylori thing. Do you treat your patients with uh, any of these? Uh, as of now, no. I haven't really switched into H. pylori treatment yet. However, what we do in such cases, we, we have a group of patients selected in our clinics and who are actually very aware. So we tell them, we give an appointment every six months for a routine review and tell them, if you have a problem, do drop by, 24 by 7. We, in some cases where I know there's a progression of optic nerve head size, but still no field stages yet, but I've noted down in my notes from 0.3 has gone up to 0.5, 
I have a tendency after discussing with the patient to keep a baseline timolol, and then I give him to certain tablets of acetazolamide. So these patients are very aware. They pop in the tablet because we lost one or two patients uh, for glaucoma. They were, he was, they were coming like this periodically, but slowly started creeping up, and for some reason they defaulted. And then by the time they came back, the CD was already 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and they, so. So we discuss the, the possibilities with the patient. If the patient says, I still like to have a protection, then we just give them a tablet, acetazolamide, tell them to pop it when they know the typical halos happen, report it the next working day, or if they're still not becoming okay in six hours, come over and put the emergency and we take them over. I have not started uh, antivirals yet. Uh, I'm not yet convinced of antivirals yet. HPLRI is interesting. I want to see some studies coming up really too before I can really convince. But the AAO has put up about HPLRI. They've mentioned it, but I'm not still convinced yet. And so regarding it. the treatment protocol, like you said that you give a tablet of acetazolamide. Apart from that, probably because the, uh, the IUP shoots up to 50s or 60s. Yes. So do you start on one anti-glaucoma medication and call after uh, X number of days? You mean after the attack? During that yeah, attack? Yeah, during the attack. Okay, during the attack, I make sure I see them the very next day again. Next because day. I'm, uh, and sometimes I'll be inclined to give IV acetazolamide as well, depending on the pressure okay. and depending on the age and depending on the CD. If it's going to be a CD of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, I wouldn't, and if it's got a vascular compromise, okay. uh, peripheral vascular disease, other comorbidities, I wouldn't be inclined to keep him up for a long time. If he's a younger patient, first attack, maybe I can be a bit more leisure. So I, ins I make sure I see them on the very next day and after three or four days, till I can see the pressures come down, and then I let them over a two-week period. My protocol would be, um, I give them a steroid, uh, start with Pretfort, TDS, and then I bring it down as quickly as I can and put them on baseline FML, timolol acetazolamide and alpha uh, the usual ones, and then tablet IV acetazolamide, and sometimes I even have to give them tablet acetazolamide, one PD for three days, if it's really high, and then ensure it's, once it's down, I just give them a few tablets, medications, review them in two weeks. But once I'm confident with the, with the complaints of the patient, we just let them go a bit more. So it's good to know that at Brunei and in India, we are treating our PS patients the same way. Yeah, same so way. it was true. good to know. So uh, I'll keep the other questions for later. I'd like to invite Dr. Manish Singh to start the talk on ocular hypertension and normal tension glaucoma, two again very controversial topics, whom to treat and whom not to treat. Manish, no, over to you. Thank you, Arjit. I think uh, although ocular hypertension and normal tension glaucoma do form a large bulk of our patient, but sometimes we do get confused whether to treat these patients or not. And even with normal tension glaucoma, because the guidelines are not very clear or maybe we are not very accustomed with the guidelines, whatever is available. So ocular hypertension treatment study is definitely the most elaborate study on ocular hypertensive patients and very quickly going through what their guidelines is basically what they have tried to understand that how many patients of ocular hypertension will develop primary open glaucoma if you treat and if you don't treat so basically what benefit we are trying to give our patient when we treat our patients so they divided patient into two group one group where they treated and the aim was to basically reduce the ip by 20 percent and the second group which they just observed and what they found that if you treat the overall risk of uh, Progression from ocular hypertension to primary open glaucoma is around 4.4% over a five year period. But if you don't treat, 9.5% patient of ocular hypertension will develop primary open glaucoma. So interestingly, if you don't treat your ocular hypertensive patients also, and they had pressures up to as high as 32 millimeter mercury, 90% patient will not develop primary open glaucoma. And if you treat, you are definitely reducing the risk, but the risk reduction compared to the amount of treatment you have to give, it's what we call as the number needed to treat, is as high as 20. So if you're treating 20 ocular hypertensive patients, you are just preventing one patient to develop primary open glaucoma. And that also the patient will develop into early glaucoma. It's not like he's going to become blind. So we have to understand that we definitely treating all ocular hypertensive patients are not required. So now how to decide which patients to treat and which patient not to treat. So if you go for the subgroup analysis of these patients, they have shown very clearly that those patients where the central corner thickness was more than 590 with a pressure of less than 24, the risk was only 2%, which is very, very low risk. These patients can be very easily observed. But this is the group which actually needs to be treated. Those patients where the pressure was 26 and above, with a central corner thickness of less than 555. If you see the Indian population, majority of our patients actually have a CCT less than 555. 
so if you have a patient where the pressure is 26 and more the, especially the corrected pressure these are the patient where actually you should be considering treatment the rest of the patient you can very well observe the patient after having a proper baseline documentation other few risk factors which they noted in their study so if you have a patient where the high baseline IP is there thinner CCT large vertical cup disc ratio high PSD and disc hemorrhage these are the patient if you see at the time of presentation these patient also you can consider as an option for treatment interestingly in their study family history of glaucoma was not a risk factor which we routinely consider in our patients same thing has been shared by uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology in their guidelines also but if you are following up this patient make sure you have a proper documentation of the disc take a disc photograph preferably do a perimetry also have a baseline IP check the IP three four times if you can do a diurnal or at least an office diurnal have a diurnal do a CCT so that when you are following up this patient maybe every four to six monthly you know what baseline data you have to compare and then when you see changes in the disc when you see changes in the field you can treat this patient accordingly there's a glaucoma five-year risk calculator are also available based on this OHTA study where they use age, IOP, CCT, vertical cup disc ratio and pattern standard deviation as a criteria to decide how what is the risk of patient developing glaucoma over a five-year period. So based on this data, you can tell your patient, okay, you have this risk and then you can discuss with the patient whether they want to be treated or not. But whatever they have a proper documentation, do clearly mention that they need to be under follow-up because there have been so many cases where we have left the patient, patient came for follow-up after six months, then they lost to follow-up and then they came after four to five years, they had proper glaucoma. So very important, mention very clearly in your file that they have to be under follow-up. Whether they follow-up or not, it's a different issue, but they has to be properly documented. So like all ocular and, and angles, all ocular hypertension don't need to be treated also because the prevalence of ocular hypertension is much more than primary opening glaucoma in our, study, in our population. So it's almost seven to eight times more than primary opening glaucoma. So if you start treating them, you'll be unlessly treating a lot and lots of patients. Coming to normal tension glaucoma, the biggest problem in normal tension glaucoma is by definition, you should have a intraocular pressure when you've done a 24 hour diurnal within the range of less than 21 millimeter mercury but most of us don't have the facility to do a 24 hour diurn evaluation so a lot of our so called normal tension glaucoma may actually not be a normal tension glaucoma when you actually have a 24 hour IAP plus an ideal normal hypertension glaucoma should have a progressive field damage which again sometimes is difficult to explain and difficult to demonstrate because a lot of time it's a one time damage so a lot of people believe that primary opening glau normal tension glaucoma actually is a continuum of primary opening glaucoma and where IOP is not only the risk factor, there are other risk factors also. Coming to prevalence, there are not too many data from India where they have shown the prevalence, but we all know in Japanese population, they have shown as high as almost 90% of their patients do have a normal tension glaucoma. But the role of IOP is still there and collaborative normal tension glaucoma study has shown that if you treat this patient, you can reduce the risk from 35 to 12%. So definitely if the normal tension glaucoma patient also even if the pressure is normal, bringing them down further definitely helps your patients. But interestingly, in their study, 50% of normal tension glaucoma didn't progress. So take home message is, if you have a patient with normal tension glaucoma, you're not very sure about the diagnosis. Maybe the disc is like borderline, the perimeter not clearly matching, all the pressures are normal. You can do a baseline evaluation, do a field, take a disc photograph, do a CCT, and you can very well observe the patient, do a field every six months, and see whether the patient are actually progressing or not, because as they have shown, 15 of patients may not progress over the time period. We also need to look into other factors when we're treating normal tension glaucoma like the vascular factors, the neuroprotection and we all know there are a lot of studies coming about the CSF pressure also. Vascular factors are definitely more associated with normal tension glaucoma. We see more disc hemorrhages in these patients. In fact, if you see a disc hemorrhage, you should always think whether you are dealing with a normal tension glaucoma or not. Also to have a history of migraine, whether there is history of sleep apnea, look for nocturnal hypertension. Nocturnal hypertension for a cardiac point of view is good for the heart, but if you have a dip of blood pressure more than 20%, definitely it's bad for the eyes. You can take a help of your cardiologist, have a 24 hour BP assessment and at least you can modify their blood pressure treatment ask them to not to use blood pressure medicines at night also you can discuss with the cardioloids if we can reduce the blood pressure medication so have more uh, better control of the blood pressure over control of blood pressure is not good for a glaucoma patients Dr. Harry has also highlighted that in classical normal tension glaucoma, you should consider not using beta blocker. But again, this is controversial. There are some studies which have shown that beta blocker do not affect much in normal tension glaucoma. But if I have a patient 
of a normalization glaucoma who is progressing even on prostaglandin and if an option of using a beta blocker or maybe a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor I should be preferring a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor in these cases compared to a beta blocker. Logers has highlighted the role of brimonidine as a neuroprotector and they have shown that patients of normalization glaucoma when you treat with brimonidine versus timolol although the pressure control is same the risk of progression was more in the patient with the beta blocker and they postulated that probably it's a neuroprotective effect of brimonidine which helps you in these patients so basically again similarly if I have a patient progressing so in normalization glaucoma your drug of choice will always be a prostaglandin but next to prostaglandin you can consider a, something like a brimonidine for its suspected neuroprotection or a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor for its suspected uh, vascular factor protection as a better option. Coming to the last topic the CSR pressure in glaucoma if you see this is the lamina cribrosa and lamina cribrosa is affected by two pressures on the two sides. In the front you have the intraocular pressure which is basically trying to push this backward and from behind the CSF pressure sort of gives you a support to the lamina cribrosa. So what happens in that what this is called as the trans lamina cribrosa pressure generally the IOP is higher than the CSF pressure and this is the reason why we get this type of cupping. But when the CSF pressure is high and the IOP is low you get papilledema so basically when the CSF pressure is high it is pushing the disc forward and you get papilledema on the other hand when the CSA pressure is low and the pressure is high you get these type of cupping. So there is a postulate that in cases of normalization glaucoma your CSA pressure is low and that is why the disc itself is susceptible to pressure ranges. So even with the normal pressure you develop cupping. Similarly ocular hypertensive patient has been shown to have a higher CSA pressure that is why they can withstand 25, 30, 35 pressure. So this CSA pressure do have a role. And last point lifestyle modification you have to have a regular exercise stop smoking because these normalization glaucoma patient overall systemic factors do come into play so to conclude as I was telling you prostaglandin will be drug of choice but I'll probably be preferring a brimonidine and carbonic and added inhibitor as a second line and trabeculectomy also are useful to bring down the pressure also whenever there is atypical progression do consider neuroimaging and have an overall evaluation of the patient especially with a cardiologist to have a, make sure you're not missing any other causes of ischemia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Any questions for Dr. Manish Singh? Okay. Manish, I have a question uh, uh, regarding OHD. Like you mentioned a number of drug of choices for NTG patients. So for OHD, do you start uh, have something specific in mind when you start? Uh, in all our patients, whether it's ocular hypertension or a primary open glaucoma or even a normal tension glaucoma, we consider using prostaglandin as the best drug because we all know it has the least side effect profile with the best IP control. In case the prostaglandin is contraindicated or the patient is allergic to that particular drug, then only we don't use prostaglandin. But even in angle closure glaucoma also, once you have done the PI, angles have opened up, the inflammation is under control, we always use prostaglandin as the first line drug, except maybe probably the secondary glaucomas. And uh, one more question regarding NTG, before you establish a patient as NTG, you should have a DVT, a diurnal variation. So in your busy clinical practice, I know that's not possible. So how do you deal with that? How do you label so that, a patient yeah, as NTG? That I was telling you, ki in reality, most of our NTG patients, we are not sure they're actually NTG or not. So that's a big problem we face in, not only in private practice, even in institute also I have worked previously, doing a 24-hour diurnal admitting a patient is practically very difficult most of us won't do it you will be dependent on some of the technician you don't know how sincerely they are doing it what instrument they are using then waking a patient at three o'clock at night is so practically it's difficult to do a 24-hour dinner what we do often we do an office dinner starting say eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock seven o'clock again it's not a replacement of 24 hour but you can get an idea that instead of treating the patient on one pressure you are getting say six seven pressure so you have a better baseline data to understand what is the pressure and how much IOP reduction I need to go for these patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. If it's negative if we do not get high pressures does not rule out anything but if we get a high pressure during that time at least it tells us that maybe it's a POAG or uh, uh, Azim, sir, yeah, is there and, anything you'd uh, like to add? So, no, I'd like to ask him. Um, you, when, before we decide on an NTG patient, uh, uh, OHD patient, and tell them, okay, we're going to, you're off, we are not going to treat you after discussion. So, what are the baseline parameters you convince yourself before, apart from the fields, your nerve fiber assessment, and the central corneal thickness, your baseline IOPs, corneoscopies? And then, once you convince, and what is it, what is it, 
point in which you decide to say that, okay, I'm going to see you only after, is it six months or one year? Is that going to come back with the routine fields and OCT routinely? Or do you just see them and clinically suspect and then do a fields or not? So what is your protocol to say that, okay, these patients are not going to come back to me often. What are the criteria and how often do you see them? So for ocular hypertensive patients, initially what I try to do, whenever we see the pressures are more than 20, obviously we do a complete evaluation as you mentioned, have a proper CCT, have a gonioscopy. I always, always take a disc photograph because they have been very helpful. 10 year, 15 year back also patient we have, we have taken a disc photograph, now we can see and OCT I generally won't do for these patients, although ideally we should be doing it because the problem is repeating OCT in our setup, sometimes the cost becomes an issue. And we have also mentioned that the OCT technologies keep changing so fast that sometimes the discs don't change and the OCT machines have changed. So in my short practice of say 12, 13, year, 15 years of glaucoma, we moved from the status to the spectral domain, now the spectral is. So the machines have changed and the patient disc hasn't changed actually. So it's not very cost effective personally in my practice, but this photograph definitely I'll do a baseline perimetry also. And I'll see what is the range of pressure. Maybe I'll do an office dianal as I was mentioning. If it's a range of 20 to 25 with the CCT normal to higher, I'll just explain the patient that I don't even mention the term glaucoma. I'll just say that your pressures are high. You need to just recheck your pressure once in a while. Initially, I'll keep them under three month, four month follow-up, maybe for once or twice, and then sometime one yearly follow-up. Because after two, three follow-up, you can get an idea that the disc are stable, patients is not having any other problem. Do take a history of steroids also. Like also, we take a history of homeopathic medicine. Sometimes these patients are taking with or some skin ointment and all. That is also something important. And also, if they have some smoking and all addiction, I generally try to tell them that you can stop smoking. So these things I try to do, and then based on that. Mostly if the patients are stable every yearly we follow up, but if the pressure is above 25, I generally won't be comfortable leaving a patient with a pressure of 26 and above because again I was telling you I'm not doing a 24 hour dianal, so if I'm leaving a patient with 25 above without doing a 20, I might be taking a risk. So these patients I'll definitely tell them you'll be better off if you put on medication. Most patients I've seen they prefer to be on medication. Some patients may say, okay, look, I stay close by, I can very well come every three to four months, so there's no issue. So these patients we can always ask to be in a close follow up and then accordingly we treat. So we always try to make the patient part of the treatment and so that we can work in continuation. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to stress. So in glaucoma, the most important thing is making the patient a part of treatment. And what we do in my center is we have a discussion with the patient and tell them put all the cards on the table and say that it's like wearing a seat belt. Your friends are driving without a seat belt, they didn't have an accident. Do you want to wear a seat belt or not? And then tell them these are the factors, these are the risks you've been having. What do you think? Do you want to start it or do you want to wait and watch? If the patient says, yes, I want to start, those are the patients I find usually come back to us regularly. If patients are reluctant to say, I'll come back later, then we keep a tag on them. And then we say, you still have to come back to us. And sometimes some patients slip the net. We tell them, even if you're transferring to another place, please make sure that you need to have your pressures checked. They can be students going overseas for, for studies. Just say, once a year, please make sure you go. Don't go to an optical shop for glass checkup. If you go there, please make sure you see an eye doctor to get your pressure also checked. Thank you so much. So we'll move on to the next topic. Now we know that uh, dry eye itself is on the increase and the incidence and prevalence of glaucoma is on the increase. And we've been increasing the number of drops to treat glaucoma. But we as glaucoma specialists are more concerned with the optic disc and treating the glaucoma part. So regarding dry eye, we are not that much concerned. So are we silent to this menace? So Dr. Sagar Barva is going to bring more clarity to this topic. Uh, good morning, everybody. At the outset, uh, let me thank Arijit to, uh, to kind of make me part of his course. Thanks, Arijit. So uh, to answer your question, I was indeed silent to this menace for about three, four years, till three, four years back, till I saw this. This is a patient, a, a patient of mine who was on anti-glaucoma medication, underwent a cataract surgery, and ended up with a picture like this about six weeks post cataract surgery. This really opened, uh, uh, opened my eyes. So what was exactly happening here? You see, ultimately the patient recovered in a period of next four weeks, but when we started uh, digging into the case, what, what went wrong? Why this patient actually developed this kind of a uh, presentation? So what we saw was uh, we actually missed dry eye due to mimoitis in this patient. To start with, this patient was already on anti glaucoma medication. On the top of it, he had an array of post-cataract medication, which included steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So essentially, a combination of these three actually caused the ocular surface breakdown. So this really opened um, uh, my eyes for this particular condition. 
So when you talk about glaucoma, uh, goals of glaucoma treatment, it's essentially, we all know, it's to maintain patient's visual function as well as to maintain quality of life. And when you have you know, dry eye which sets in in a patient, the quality of life is definitely going to go down and this will ultimately lead to poor compliance and ultimately glaucoma progression. So is there any relationship between glaucoma and dry eye? Well, there are close to 800 odd articles that have been published to actually address this question. And uh, just to quote a few, this is a, an article which essentially takes data from the German registry of glaucoma patients and it, it has close to 20,000 odd glaucoma patients and they found that almost 52.6% uh, had concomitant diagnosis of dry eye. And, uh, and uh, they, when they did a, a, sub, a, a subgroup analysis, they found that uh, almost 60% of pseudoexfoliation patients had dry eye. They didn't give the reason and most of these patients were on monotherapy. Across the globe, many studies have been done on uh, cases. Uh, it is a case control studies on, uh, with glaucoma group and control group. And majority of them have shown that glaucoma group has uh, prevalence from 50, uh, 40 to 70% uh, showing dry eye versus uh, control group showing negligible uh, incidence. So why is this glaucoma having higher risk of dry eye? So we all know glaucoma being a chronic condition, you have to treat them for years together. And most of these patients beyond two years would need two, at least two or three medications to control their IOP. And yet on the top of it, you are using these preservative containing medications which will have its own effect. So when we talk about ocular surface changes, essentially we are looking at two things, a direct impact of the drug as well as indirect impact that comes to the preservative. When we look at the direct impact, there are studies now which have clearly shown that, for example, there is a prostaglandin analog. It has shown to have higher prevalence of uh, uh, obstructive movement gland dysfunction. Beta blocker, because of its action on beta receptors, actually reduce the basal, uh, tear, uh, ba basal tear turnover rate. Also, it can reduce corneal sensations and, inf and bring about inflammatory changes in conjunctiva. But it's the indirect effect which is more important, which is a res result of preservative. Most uh, precisely, benzalkonium chloride, we know it is the most commonly used preservative with, with uh, different concentrations available. And uh, it's an, a very effective preservative. That's the reason why it is being used so uh, commonly. But it has, has its own side effects. It causes reduction in the goblet cell density. It has effect on the corneal epithelium. It leads to loss of microvilli at the epithelial cell edges and it actually accelerates uh, desquamation. It causes cell wrinkling. It causes increased inflammation. You know, inflammatory markers like MMP levels are increased. And this is what leads to you know, dry eye. Then there is a, something called as a polyquad, which is also seen in some of the uh, glaucoma medications, and it causes epithelial damage and conjunctival reduction in the conjunctival globe cells. So then there is a concept of <coughs> dose-dependent toxicity. So what is the upper limit that one can go for when you are addressing dry eye? So uh, there is a study which has actually addressed this. So it says that the stronger predictor, uh, predictors for OSD is if you are using more than four drops or two topical me glaucoma medications is what is the upper limit for back usage. And we really don't follow this a lot of times it goes beyond that. Then there is a concentration, uh, there is a the concept of concentration dependent toxicity. As I was talking to you about, you have variable concentration of back. So if you have higher the concentration of back, there is a more chance of toxicity. So across the different uh, anti glaucoma medication, you can see the, the difference in the back concentration. You can see the commonly used medications have actually have higher back concentration. This is important when you're dealing with the patient who has dry eye or who develops dry eye because that's the patient whom you would want to put him on a lower concentration back values. So this chart is very important as far as the pack. Now how do you know where, where how do you look for which, which medication has lesser uh, back concentration. So this simple website actually can go through this website <coughs> and they, it gives, gives you a photo with the content there. You can easily pick up content from there and use it for your patient's thing. Now, why, why does the dry eye get missed in glaucoma? So the simple reason is we don't specifically look for it because we don't give so much of importance to it. And most of our patients really don't complain about it. Even if they complain, the complaints are so non-specific that you don't get a corresponding sign to it. So we think we actually label it as a psychological issue. So there is a big symptom sign mismatch when you talk about glaucoma and dry eye. On the top of it, the, there are a wide range of clinical manifestations like simple hyperemia, what you can see here, to extensive corneal uh, involvement uh, in the form of corneal uh, SPKs, or sometimes you can always have masquerades like vernal keratoconjunctivitis in uh, this case which was uh, published 
or sometimes even like a picture like pseudopemphicoid. So you have such a wide variety of symptoms that you don't really don't attribute it to dry eye. So what I will suggest you is that whenever you deal with a patient who comes to you, you divide into three categories. One is a normal patient, second is a pre-existing dry eye, and second is a patient who is on treatment and develops surface issues. So how do you approach these patients? So first thing you would do is basically try out to find, try to find out certain risk factors which will actually uh, give pointers towards development of dry eye. So you look for old age, postmenopausal women, patients who have very high screen time, patients who have autoimmune uh, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, they are on systemic medications, they have stress. So these are all patients who will have some or the other, uh, uh, has some possibility that they will eventually develop dry eye. These are simple questionnaires which, uh, which are available on web. Uh, the most common is OSDI questionnaire and DEQ questionnaires. These are available. You can actually ask the patient to fill up. This will give you an idea as to how much is the severity of the patient's complaints. This severity will actually help you to correlate the severity of dry eye. And simple clinical evaluation, really dry eye assessment doesn't need too much of skill. It's a very simple clinical assessment right from lid margin to conjunctiva, tear meniscus, tear debris, T-BIRT and Schirmer's test. These are all simple evaluation tools that you can use. Simple uh, compressing the lid margin will tell you what is the quality of mebum that the patient has. If the clear mebum, that means we are not dealing with the mebum gland dysfunction. If you have a cloudy mebum or incipitated mebum is where we are looking at mebum gland dysfunction. Corneal stating pattern, it's a very good idea to document how the stating pattern is because uh, you can use this scale called as Oxford scale and actually you can document it in your file because this will help you when you follow up these patients and understand whether it is improving or not improving. So the, the see the highest grade, almost fifth, more than 50% of the cornea is involved by the stain and believe me, if you start looking for it, you will get it, you will get it. We, just that we don't look at this stain pattern that we don't really, we actually miss this quite often. In subtle cases, if you can see this, see the right eye and see the left eye. What do we see in the left eye? You can see a ring there. So this ring is essentially nothing but a 80 head imprint. Now why this should happen in one eye is not happening in the other eye because that eye has been on medication for the last eight years, which actually tells me that there are certain surface changes that are already happening in that eye. So these are subtle signs which are at you, you should not miss it. So if it's a normal patient, just start with a single agent, a minimal possible dose, routine lubrication is absolutely not indicated. But if the patient has a pre-existing dry eye, follow the due to due to recommendation, which is available online. It's very simple to understand. It's a step ladder approach. I will not be going into details of it, but it's, it's a very nicely written uh, recommendation. Just follow that. If the patient is on pre-existing dry eye, as we discussed, you have to reduce the back concentration or you need to shift the patient to a back free. A simple example is Lumigan 0.01 person has a back of 0.02 person. You can just make it 0.03 and the back concentration comes down significantly. Or you just shift to a back free medication. Now have a look at this right eye and left eye. The left eye looks little better than the right eye. Why? See the left eye is on only one single medication. The right eye is on two medications. Essentially three doses, Timolol two times, Biomet one time versus Biomet one time. But what is happening is there is a three time greater exposure to back in the right eye and see the level of damage that is there. This is my own patient. So what you should do in this scenario is just shift to a combination therapy, bring down that number of exposure to back from three to one. And wherever possible, use preservative free medication. Now we have uh, these two medications which are available as preservative free. Comod system is there or a single unit dosage system is available uh, with these two molecules. And uh, lubricants, I'll not go into details, but you should be aware of the four classes of lubricants that are available, their, uh, their uh, thing. But more important is they, it should be applied as frequently as possible. And for certain specific lubricants, for example, one of the most commonly used lubricant is Cystine Ultra. We should be aware of it that it has something called as a HP guar, which is a pH sensitive molecule. It will not work if the pH is less than 7.5. Some of our glaucoma medications bring pH below, below 6. So if you are combining this treatment with, an, uh, say, that lubricant, the effic efficacy of that lubricant will not be very good. So this, this is something that you need to be aware. Preservatives uh, are also present in lubricants. Always go for oxidative type of preservatives, which vanishes off. Preservative free lubricants, only one uh, preservative free lubricant is available in India, which is made in India. The others are, uh, are from outside, which have been now not been used in India. But if you still want to procure it, it's available on uh, commercial websites like Amazon. But see the cost. It's almost 2,400 rupees for a 30-day course of UNIMS. Compare this to our Indian one, it's just 160 for 30 UNIMS. So the cost factor is a huge factor when you're looking at uh, preservative-free medication. 
but finally we are definitely seeing that ocular surface has got its due recognition in the in this society, in this uh, european glaucoma society guidelines in 2017 they have included ocular surface as an important consideration when you start the patient on treatment that means they recommend you to see the ocular surface and if the patient has significant dry eye they do insist to start preservative free medication so to just sum up dry eye and glaucoma are definitely closely related actively look for dry eye before starting any form of treatment keep the medication to the minimum to mitigate cumulative drugs dose toxicity lubricants preferably preservative free should be used in uh, in the cases where it is required and modify treatment based on ocular surface and patient symptoms thank you so much thank you thank you sagarta for that excellent talk lot of important issues came up in that talk uh, does anybody have any questions i think manish has a question uh, yeah please yeah i i just wanted to ask a very simple uh, practical question that that is when a patient comes to you with glaucoma when you follow and if the patient doesn't complain of dry eye do again you go for a dry eye uh, work up and start treatment b before the patient becomes symptomatic do you give any prophylactic therapy no or how do you start so that's what i was just saying that just simple clinical evaluation on slit lamp will give you an idea whether the patient is going to develop a dry eye or is having a mild dry eye uh, before just starting the treatment look at the lid lid which you can see from the thing just compress the lid margin see that meibomian uh, gland secretion very very important very very important routine lubrication in a normal person who has a good tear meniscus height no staining pattern on the cornea and has no symptoms the question is will actually it's difficult to you know use in a clinical in a in a in our busy practice setting but tear meniscus size tear debris corneal staining pattern will give you an idea whether this patient is having dry eye or is going to likely to develop dry eye so the routine lubrication definitely not necessary but the point that i want to highlight is that start with minimum possible dosage because in the long run definitely what started with zero over a period of time 50 to 70% of these patients will develop surface issues there's no doubt about it so you mean say the starting any patient on any anti glaucoma medication you must uh, do a dosage straight absolutely because you are anyway doing it for your iop measurement so before you put that 80 head just see the staining pattern of the cornea that that's a good take home Money. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Siraj. What has been your experience with this uh, preservative-free anti-glaucoma medication, and what are the cases you use them? Uh, we don't have many preservative-free in our because it's uh, it's given by the government, so we don't have many preservative-free with us. So I look for it when I suspect the patients has go have got uh, dryness. Either I put them on a gel at night if they're on timo, if uh, they're on triopros, for example, I tell them to have the triopros at 8 p.m. and then put the gel at night before they go to bed so the gently the gel keeps working through the night uh, that's what we do and other or we give preservative free eye drops uh, not for glaucoma but artificial tears no problem so I have the one last question yeah none of the brands except for safrut and which has just come are preservative free yeah so if a patient with glaucoma has dry eye would you sacrifice a brand for a generic which is preservative free would you do that no, uh, uh, see what you are saying is absolutely right there is no now again this is like a trial error method you have to go in for a molecule which is less toxic to the patient and at times you have to even give him a, a drug holiday so that happens intermittently with a few of my patients who have severe surface issues what i do uh, when they land up into an acute phase i just stop all the medications and then again start from single dose and then keep going forward but preservative free medications will come so already this one has come so you'll have more in the pipeline thank you thank you, thank you so much sir thank you yeah please ma'am that is the biggest problem with dry eye most of the patients are asymptomatic with severe dry eye as well so you don't really depend on patient symptoms at the most you can use a questionnaire to elicit where they are facing the problem so if the patient is not symptomatic even if you find that absolutely so better you should do something absolutely without making him concerned that this is another treatment whatever another issue whatever absolutely yeah yeah sure yeah that's what i do i in such cases i give them a gel just put the gel at night time so the it's not affecting the medication penetration at the same time we're giving them 8 hours of 
a gel coating the cornea, so the next day the corneas are better. And, and so another thing which I find in dry eyes, which gets it worse, is uh, the chlorine in the tap water. Some of the patients, they have a habit of washing the eyes with tap water. And uh, when in, at least in our setup, then we found when, they, when we ask them to stop that habit, the dry eye symptom or the symptom of toxicity tends to come down. Uh, the chlorine and other things, so we tell them in case you really insist on it, use such mineral water bottles. So the additional uh, extraneous factors can be also brought down actually. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Dipanjan Pal for the next topic, which is on neuroprotection and glaucoma. So there has been a lot of noise for years about neuro, a lot of noise about neuroprotection, and uh, even though we have a few drugs which claim to have neuroprotective properties, we are not really sure about how to proceed. So I hope uh, Dr. Dipanjan Pal is going to shed some light into this controversial topic. Hello. Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Origin, for including me in this IC. So, glaucoma is the most common optic neuropathy, and there is progressive degeneration and death of retinal ganglion cells, and degeneration is widespread from retina to visual cortex. But unfortunately, lowering intraocular pressure does not address this retinal ganglion cell susceptibility to degeneration. So our new approaches to therapy in glaucoma that uh, we will uh, revisit currently available anti-glaucoma medication that offers new neuroprotection and then we switch on to discuss the next-gen therapeutics which aims at uh, retinal ganglion cell survival, protection and rebuild neuroconnections to retina and we will start giving some new concept about neuroenhancement. So when you talk about glaucoma that events leading to RGC cell death, it is either uh, damage to RGC survival pathways or there it, that uh, the triggers of apoptotic pathways. So either it starts from mechanical pressure at lamina cribrosa or it's an ischemia or genetic factors ultimately leading to obstruction to axoplasmic flow and it depletes the neurotrophic factors that are supposed to maintain the health and nutrition of the retinal ganglion cells or otherwise there is a glial cell activation in retina and lamina cribrosa that release neurotoxin which uh, causes a glutamate excess and causes an NMD receptor activation and there is excessive calcium influx into the cell. The calcium is very damaging to mitochondria, and there is disruption of mitochondria and production of caspases, activation of proaptotic genes and inhibition of antiapoptotic genes which ultimately leads to the death of the RGCs and unfor unfortunately when a group of RGCs dies, there is a neighbor kill effect and ultimately there is progressive or secondary injury to the other RGCs. DARC or DARC is, uh, it is detection of apoptotizing retinal cells which has come recently which is a real-time visualization of apoptotic changes at the cellular level and we know that there is early exposure of phosphatidyl serine in the outer leaflet of plasma membrane of apoptotic RG cells and annexin V is a particle which has high affinity for this phosphatidyl serine. And annexin V, when it is leveled with a fluorescent marker, and this complex, which is called a fluoroprobe, is injected intervitreally, and, and the retina is scanned with an argon laser of 488 nanometer. And it, these, these specific areas are excited. And there is a confocal laser scanning ophthalmoscope is used to assess the retina for these fluorescent white spots and which represents apoptotic RGCs. So if we can have this, it will be possible to identify the, this uh, group of patients prior to irreversible visual loss and will provide a rapid and objective assessment of clinical intervention and will also shorten the period of clinical trials. So um, uh, we know very well about brimonidine and there has been multiple publications on its effect. Um, in NMD receptor activation or glu 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 glutamate excess pathways and things like that. And, but it is being proven mostly in animal trials. But uh, LOX trial, this is low pressure glaucoma treatment study and th this is the first randomized double blind four year study that actually compared the visual outcome in low pressure glaucoma patients with bramodine and timolol where primary endpoint was visual field deterioration. 
And in the key, key outcome, there was statistically fewer bimodine-treated patients had visual field progression by point towards the regression than timolol-treated many patients. But are we really there? As we see from the study, that there was significant dropout in the bimodine group that was amounted to almost 20%. So there may be a group of patients who were actually progressing but were not detected in the study. And the subjects in the both groups were actually under-treated. And then, with the same uh, group, uh, Dr. Murais and all, when they saw the basic and intercurrent risk factor, how they actually affected uh, the study, and they saw the neuroprotective effect of bramonidine was unrelated to its iodine property on change in ocular perfusion pressure. So the current approaches for neuroprotection would be either uh, rescuing this damaged retinal ganglion cells, or there are strategies to improve the optic nerve perfusion or optic nerve degeneration, uh, regeneration. So there are some new agents for to improve optic nerve head perfusion apart from the group of dorsalamide what we have seen. There are some rock inhibitors that have come that is going to come. Uh, either in top topical application one rock inhibitors have, have come but we are not very really sure whether it is actually they have not claimed about uh, this uh, ONH per perfusion part, uh, it, something is going to come as an interfetal injection. There is cannabinoid receptor uh, a, a, agonist, and there is centrally acting calcium channel inhibitors like nimodipine, lomerazine, and flunarazine, etc. Neurotrophins is a group of drugs that is supposed to rescue the damaged retinal ganglion cells. And if we apply exogenous neurotrophic factors, it can actually prolong RGC survival in vitro, which has been uh, ex experimented in, in vitro in, uh, in animal studies. Neurotrophins have also been tried in ALS and Parkinsonism pa 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 patients by the name of BDNA for GDNF. The strategies for sustained endogenous expression of injected growth factors and uh, they are named as this uh, transfection of growth factor genes into RGCs via viral vectors. So the, so, so the actual uh, challenge is uh, if we transfect the RGCs in vitro or in vivo by various ne ne neurotrophins, the actual challenge would be whether these neurotrophins are going to uh, f then to repopulate the RGCs, so that they, 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 they are lies a real challenge. Then we, we can actually stimulate the RGCs with uh, electrical activities by putting more calcium into the body. The X-linked caspase in, in, in inhibitor is also currently under trial for NION. There is transplantation of stem or progenital cells. The challenge is not there. We can transfect the cells into uh, the stem cells there, but whether the new RGCs are going to repopulate from the stem cells, there lies the actual challenge. So, uh, this is another uh, beautiful thing. It has been, uh, it, has, it, it is a neurotrophin secreting device, which is called Renexus from Neurotech uh, USA. This, this secretes CNTF. This device is being implanted in pars plana and uh, stays for life and it has undergone phase two trial in patients with retinitis pigmentosa and it is currently under trial for POVG is recruiting patients. This, is, this may be a hope. And coming to the last part, the holy grail, that is the optic nerve regeneration. And uh, this actually walk in two ways that, that, that blocks the inhibitory signals and intrinsic growth ability, or there is trans cell transplantation. So that we know that the glial tissue release inhibitory molecules that actually signals our disease to stop growing. So we need to do something or develop something that actually inhibit these inhibitory molecules. So one of them is NOGO, which is being investigated for spinal cord injury. As is ketrine, this is one of the rock inhibitors, and that inhibits signaling pathways with RGC nexons that mediate these top six signals. These molecules could be tested for an ability to degenerate optic nerve axons. 
And there is the other part that is, uh, enhances intrinsic growth, 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 ability, or the holy grail, this is uh, stem cell transplantation that has been shown to enhance RG section survival when injected intraocularly in experimental model. And then uh, the, the real part is that the, the actual challenge is to transfer this injected cell into the real phenotype. Neuroenhancement is a newer concept which targets a therapeutic window between dysfunction and death of retinal ganglion cells. It's a kind of treatment that actually improves RGC health and function, uh, supposed to be a promising tool which can shorten the time scale of therapeutic trial. The examples are neurotrophin, cetylcholine, or transcorneal or transorbital electric stimulation. So to conclude, IOP lowering will remain as primary neuroprotectant. And there is enough motivation to move towards complementing intraocular pressure lowering. Further research is happening towards overcoming the need for IOP lowering and neuroenhancing with newer new neurotrophins really hold promise. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dipanjana, for that wonderful talk. So like I mentioned before, there's a lot of noise regarding neuroprotection, neuroregeneration, neuro rejuvenation so you'll see these papers which are coming out which have a lot of these names but i would like to ask uh, uh, the speakers whether anybody really uses a drug as a neuroprotectant or let's say citicoline something as a neuroprotectant or is it still iop lowering all the way uh, from my side when i'm choosing the drug i choose a drug which has got some pro like for example prostaglandin analogs, uh, betoxylol. If you have a choice, if I see the patient's bit bad, if I have to choose one, I tend to prefer one which has got some tend propensity towards protection, but I'm not using specifically for that. But I tend to strongly prefer towards drugs which have that also because I, we all realize now that it's a very important, your protection is important also. So we try to go and then also look for other factors like, you know, hypotension, like how he rightly pointed out. So we have to write, have a balance. So not only the intraocular pressure, we're slowly focusing towards having the posterior, the optic nerve head kind of perfusion, and what we can do at an early stage itself and rather than waiting for an advanced stage. So it will slow down the decline of those glaucoma patients. So I tend to do that, actually. By Dr. Alan Harris uh, in Kolkata. And he uh, showed how in his lab he has uh, really done ex uh, extensive studies and proved that dorsolamide has a big role in vascular protection, uh, vascular uh, flow and neuroprotection. So since then, um, whenever I am dealing with a query in TG or where I think I want to add on a neuroprotection, I prefer that drug. Right. And uh, the, uh, Dr. Dipanjan Paul had shown that wonderful slide on DRC, where nowadays in real time, you can see the death of the apoptotic cells, which fluoresce. So probably that will give us more idea and in the future the treatment advances. Please, sir. Yeah. Yes, that, that's what I wanted because citicoline, they claim that, you know, give a 45-day yeah. constant treatment, then a citicoline break, and then another actually, 45 days. Uh, it has been shown promises on PERG. You know, don't, it has not, uh, uh, in pattern ERG, it has shown promises when, when, uh, when uh, at least you have to use two years. And the, the thing is, for first three months, if you use in a very high dose, that is at least uh, two to four Tablets, tablets or capsules, whichever way they, they have. If you if you take, take if you ask the patient to take, and you can you can ask the patient when he is having some kind of uh, some kind of improvement in his life, okay? Because most of the time they have uh, lost contrast. They uh, they they cannot see things clearly at night, okay? So citicoline sometimes imp sometimes improves. As per patient's view, when, when I use uh, citicoline in 10 patients, at least three, four patients, they say that they have some kind of improvement. They have some better vision in low, low light, and they have a little better contrast. So definitely, sorry? Subjectively, many of them... Yes, subjective yeah. improvement is a big thing for them. Yes. And uh, primarily, I was thinking pro probably, you, you know, patient have a uh, have a thing like uh, if I have given something they feel that it is yeah, a psychological feeling it is not like that it is not like that because many many patients say that uh, yes I have some yeah. 
some yeah, better one take on yeah. that actually if you yeah. see the published literature with city colin with jinko biloba curcumin extract there are articles in pubmed where they've shown that there have been visual improvement and all but these are controversial areas the costs are involved you have to give for a long time so in these cases i personally prefer to go by the standard guideline like the egs or ao or even the world glaucoma association consensus which have very clearly mentioned ki they are not proven so we want to use it use it but they are not proven so it's like like a placebo only right so thank you, you. Use it. thank you Bramonidine has actually improved their visual fields. Have you documented it? That Bramonidine has actually improved their visual fields. Visual fields like the the patient feels a subjective difference. Actually, that's what the LOGTS study had said. But there were a lot of flaws in that particular study. The visual fields okay. uh, had a lot of flaws. But ma'am is kind of uh, reiterating the same thing. Okay. So probably there is some truth to it. There is a truth to it if we if we consider the uh, uh, acute phase of disease. Yeah. That uh, one of my slides I I showed that neuro enhancement. That particular thing can happen if the patient comes with a really high intraocular pressure and you lower down the pressure. You can definitely have a immediate improvement in visual field that can be documented. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dipanjan. So I'll move on to my talk, which is about the vascular factors in glaucoma and the role of the importance of ocular blood flow in clinical practice. So I'll start with the term called vascular autoregulation of the eye. So what is it? So it is the process by which the body attempts to maintain a stable ocular blood flow despite the changes in the pulse pressure. So the eye tries to maintain that the blood flow to it remains constant all the time and primarily it is achieved through the metabolic mechanism, which is the concentration of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, and the myogenic mechanism. The neurogenic and the hormonal pathways play very little role in it. Now, what happens is this autoregulation is constantly subjected to challenges like intraocular pressure increase, fluctuating blood pressure, thereby decreasing the ocular perfusion pressure, and or the rise in the tissue metabolic demand. So because of this constant pressure, there is impaired autoregulation or vascular dysregulation which occurs. This causes altered level of oxygen which is supplied to the tissues. And this can cause A, ischemic damage if there is insufficient oxygen, which will lead to the damage to the optic nerve and the RGCs. Or B, if there is excess oxygen, it will lead to oxidative damage. So too much or too little, both are bad for the eye. Now, we can see clinically some correlation between the vascular factors and glaucoma when we see a disc hemorrhage or a peri peripapillary atrophy. What we don't see are the roles of aging, systemic hypertension, and migraine. But they do have a role. For example, with aging, there are two things which happen. One, the choroidal thickness keeps on decreasing from, let's say, 200 microns at birth to 80 microns at 90 years of age. So there is a constant decrease in the choroidal thickness. And B, the autoregulatory capacity of the eye is decreased. So these two lead to a reduced ocular blood flow. Number two, we don't think about it much, but 47% of the glaucoma patients have hypertension. So hypertension can affect glaucoma in two ways. One, with an increase in the blood pressure, the chronic raised pressure damages the smaller blood vessels. And B, if you're treating these patients with antihypertensives, probably there is some nocturnal hypertension which is going on, and that will reduce the ocular blood flow. So these are the two factors where, by which hypertension can affect glaucoma patients. And C, 15.6% of the glaucoma patients have migraine. So what's the uh, correlation between the two? Both of these diseases have increased levels of endothelin-1. So endothelin-1 causes two things. One, it causes vasoconstriction of the trabeculum. It causes vasospasm. And two, it causes constriction of the trabecular meshwork whereby it raises intraocular pressure. So there are these two things. And again, this leads to a reduced ocular blood flow. Now, it's really not possible in our busy clinical settings to measure the ocular perfusion pressure, which is actually the driving force required for the ocular blood flow. So if you try to measure the mean ocular perfusion pressure, it's a bit complex. So j let's just uh, look at the two things which we can measure. One is the systolic perfusion pressure, which is the systolic blood pressure minus the IOP. And number two is the diastolic perfusion pressure, which is probably more important, which is the diastolic blood pressure minus the intraocular pressure. 
So abnormally low ocular perfusion pressure will cause lower ocular blood flow, which will result in optic nerve head and retinal ischemia, as well as reperfusion injury. So this is not something new. The low ocular perfusion pressure being identified as an independent risk factor for glaucoma progression has been there since the consensus series 6, which was way back. Now, what is the evidence for documented reduced perfusion pressure in glaucoma? There's not one, but a number of studies like the Barbados study, the Baltimore, the Egner Newmark, the early manifest glaucoma trial, the Rotterdam, and all these studies done in different population groups have shown that reduced ocular perfusion pressure is an important risk factor for glaucoma development and or progression. Now, where lies the problem? The problem is for an individual who's standing up, let's say the mean arterial pressure is 70 and the IUP is 13, has a perfusion pressure of 57. The same person when he lies down has a pressure of 84 and an IUP of 15, which gives a perfusion pressure of 69. So there is no really one concrete value. And therefore, even though all these studies point towards the same thing, they cannot specify a number or a figure. They, we know that there is a three to six fold increase in glaucoma prevalence if you have a low ocular perfusion pressure. But what is that value? Some studies say it's less than 30 diastolic ocular perfusion pressure. Some studies say it's less than 50. So ocular perfusion pressure being a surrogate or a derived factor is not really concrete. And therefore, we moved on to something called an ocular blood flow, which is more concrete and which we can measure. Now, there are a huge number of instruments to measure ocular blood flow, but color Doppler imaging is probably the one which has emerged as the most important. So what you're seeing is the blood flow inside the ophthalmic artery, the blood flow inside the central retinal artery, and the blood flow in the short posterior ciliary arteries. So for an ophthalmologist, it's really difficult. But if you look at these small blood vessels here, that are the, those are the short posterior ciliary arteries. Number two is the central retinal artery, and this is the ophthalmic artery. I'll just show a small clip. You, you can see the short posterior ciliary arteries, the central retinal artery, and the ophthalmic artery. So it's something which is difficult for us as ophthalmologists to perceive, but it can be done with the help of a radiologist friend. So what you can get is a tracing, which will show you the graph of the ophthalmic artery, the central retinal artery, and the short posterior ciliary arteries. And you get a large number of values. But three values are important. One, the peak systolic velocity. Two, the end diastolic velocity. And number three, the resistive index. Again. There is no normative data. There is nothing as normal. So it's very difficult to quantify what is normal and what is abnormal. Now, if you look at these graphs, this is for a control subject. This is for a patient with POAG. And this is for a patient with NTG. So to an untrained eye, everything looks just the same. However, where's the difference? The difference is just this small shift. So with each pulse, less blood is reaching the eye. And that small amount of reduced blood flow is on the long run cause damage to the eye. So out of all these factors, only one factor, the resistive index greater than 0.75, has been associated with the development and progression of glaucoma. So what is the take home from this? That lower ocular perfusion pressure, or particularly diastolic ocular perfusion pressure, is associated with the increased risk of development of glaucoma, as well as a progression of glaucoma. The autoregulatory capacity of the eye, along with the BP and IOP, these three together determine what is the actual risk. Therefore, a patient may have may be a hypertensive, but may have good autoregulatory mechanisms, so may not develop glaucoma. And the resistive index of greater than 0.75 is definitely a risk factor for glaucoma. Now you have a lesser invasive procedure, the OCT angio, where you can get the angio analytics around the optic nerve head or around the macula. So what you're looking at are these two plexuses, the superficial vascular complex and the deep vascular complex. The superficial vascular complex measures the blood flow in the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer, whereas the deep vascular complex measures the blood flow in the inner nuclei and the outer plexiform. For glaucoma, the deep plexuses don't really matter. What matters in glaucoma are, number one, the nerve fiber layer plexus around the optic disc, and number two, is if you're looking at around the macula, the nerve fiber layer plexus and the ganglion cell layer plexus, which constitutes the superficial vascular complex. So probably you're going to come up with these charts and graphs and figures where you'll be able to see the capillary dropout 
along with the RNFL defect. So this is going to be an aid. So this along with the RNFL and the GCC and the HFA will all three together probably help you better analyze glaucoma. So has this affected the treatment? The answer to that is yes, because the consensus series seven, again, that was way back in 2009, the WGA recognized that topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors have repeatedly shown to increase ocular blood flow and enhance the blood flow regulation independent of the hypertensive effect. That's the word which is important. So there have been a number of studies. In fact, the major review shows that 76% of the studies have proved that CAIs increase the ocular blood flow in the retrobulbar vasculature. So probably if you have a patient of NTG where you're suspecting that there's something going on regarding the vasculature, you can go for a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Betaxolol has also shown to have some promise. This may seem surprising to some of you, but prostaglandin analogs have also been shown to increase the ocular blood flow. Latinoprost, travoprost, and tafloprost have been proven to increase the ocular blood flow. Bimutprost is a little bit suspect because there are no real studies on it. This was a study done by Dr. Alan Harris, like uh, Shuchanda Ma'am was talking about him. He has shown that one month oral administration of antioxidants, particularly lutein containing antioxidants, they for a few weeks will increase the ocular blood flow biomarkers within the retinal vascular beds and reduce the diastolic blood pressure compared to placebo. So there are these two things. One, it increases the ocular blood flow biomarkers. Two, it reduces the diastolic blood pressure. So probably putting your glaucoma patients on lutein containing antioxidants is a good idea. And like I discussed before when I was discussing migraine, endothelin-1 causes increased constriction of the trabecular meshwork, which rises IOP. Number two, it causes vasospasm, which causes migraine and reduced ocular blood flow. So there are these endothelin antagonists which are going to come into the market. So that could probably, you know, deal with both these issues. And of course, surgery, trabeculectomy by lowering the, incre uh, lowering the intraocular pressure will cause an increase in the ocular profusion pressure. So what are the take-home messages from this particular talk? If possible, in your clinic, measure the diastolic perfusion pressure, which is the diastolic blood pressure minus the intraocular pressure. Like I said before, less than 50 or less than 30, the values are not concrete, may be significant. You can consider measurement of the ocular blood flow in the ophthalmic artery, the central retinal artery, and the short posterior ciliary arteries with the help of a radiologist friend. You can use Octa for visualizing the perfusion around the optic disc. And you can consider dozolamide, PGAs, Betaxolol, lutein containing antioxidants for the treatment of these patients, and surgical intervention may be considered for patients who are progressing in spite of normal intraocular pressure. So, if you think that ocular blood flow is going to go away, don't think again because the first ocular blood flow summit was held recently, 2nd to the 5th of September. So, in case you've missed it, you can book your dates for 2020. Thank you. Please, please. Sir. Yes. Is that effect no, it's not sustained. That's the problem with citicoline. That's the problem with antioxidants. So probably, like uh, uh, Sagarda was saying, you can give a window period, a drug-free period, and you can, you know, at intervals, continue for a long time. Yes. Yeah, that was exactly my question also. And just we were discussing that we are we sometimes only read up these literature reviews and start a drug without actually realizing whether they also have some side effects. So that is, again, a big uh, f factor that needs to be considered when we start these drugs. Right. So we'll move on to the last talk. Uh, Shuchwanda ma'am is going to bring out the anchor leg. So it's regarding whether trabs and tubes, this controversy uh, has been going on for ages now. And a lot of the Western literature is suggesting that tubes are the way to go, whereas Indian uh, surgeons feel that probably trap is the way to go. So ma'am is going to shed some light on this controversy. So this debate continues, whether it's trap, whether it's <laughs> till now, the commonly performed incisional surgeries remain trabeculectomy. And yes, now tube shunt surgeries have also picked up and have become a fairly common surgery. So whenever we are talking of traps and tubes, 
we refer to this study that has been uh, done, the TVT study or the tube versus trabeculate study, which has also published their five-year results and outcomes. And it is a well-known study which is authenticated, and it compares the efficacy and safety of tubes, that is, they use 350 millimeter square bar wells versus trap in 212 eyes, but none of these eyes were virgin eyes. They all had prior surgery, which was either a cataract surgery, or it was a failed trap, or it was a combination of a cataract and a failed surgery. The treatments went in favor of tube surgeries, saying that there was higher success rate with tube surgeries and lower reoperation rate in tube patients. There was no difference in the vision loss, IOP reduction, and supplemental IOP lowering medications in either group. So as a result, the TVT study also showed that there was a shift in practice pattern towards tube surgery. What does that mean? Tubes is the new gold standard. It is the thing of superior quality and it is the point of reference now all over the world? Maybe not. Because the TVT study, like other studies, also has its limitations. If they had probably selected virgin eyes who had not gone any, undergone any surgery and underwent trabeculectomy, the results would have been probably in favor of the traps. Whereas if they, if they had included secondary glaucomas with poor surgical prognosis, maybe the results would not have been favorable in case of a lot of tube surgeries. The inclusion and exclusion criteria and selection of patients do make difference to different studies. Like we have seen that Wilson MR also did a long-term study. It was a three-year study with about 163 patients where they compa compared the results of amet glaucoma valve with trabeculectomy. But their results showed after three years, actually 31 months, that IOPs and cumulative probabilities of success was comparable. In TVT, we see that reoperations for glaucoma in the tube surgery was repeat tube surgeries, cyclophotocoagulation, but no trabeculectomies. Whereas in the TRAP studies, repeat TRAPs were done along with tube surgeries. So what happens when tubes fail? The option remains repeat tubes, cyclophotocoagulation by endocyclophotocoagulation or diode, and shunt revision by excision of the encapsulations. But we, can, we do not actually get a chance to do a repeat trap after a tube surgery because there is a lot of scarring that has taken place because of the surgery itself. Now putting in an additional tube, <coughs> is that the end of the story? Unfortunately, Shah A, -A shows that even after a second tube, the failure rate can be pretty high, along with serious complications like tube exposure, chronic hypotony, decompensation of the cornea, diplopia, etc. And the more number of tubes, the more ocular surface irregularity and disorders, lowering the quality of life of the patient. Dr. Gede of TVT study and Dr. Chen in 2019 says that definitely the popularity of tube shunts has grown and valuable information has come up to guide surgeons in the use of tube shunts, but the higher risk of complications, surgical complications still remain. So where, do, where are we now? TRAB still remains popular as a better option for masses in India. It requires simple instrumentation and is technically simple. And as a surgeon gains more and more practice and understands what works best in his hands, it becomes a relatively predict predictable surgery. It is cost effective. It definitely lowers IOP. Long-term studies of about 10 years but in, on Asian population by the stalwart Dr. Ramanjit Sihota has shown that it is efficacious in lowering IOP and also stopping visual field progression. And on top of that, if a trap fails, we have options of doing repeat traps. We have the option of tube implantation, plus minus bleb revisions and cyclophotocoagulation. 
all of us who are practicing glaucoma realize whatever everything said and done, it is the person who is sitting across the slit lamp in front of us, the patient, who matters. So in a, non, in a progressive glaucoma, in a virgin eye, with no significant cataract, what would be the choice of surgery? Tubes, because that's what DVT is showing, or I think most of us here would agree that we would definitely go in for a trap in this. On the other hand, with a case scenario like this, an accent field rigor, cornea decompensated, PK done, now sitting in front of us with intractable secondary glaucoma, congestion, extensively scarred conjunctiva, uncontrolled with supplemental anti-glaucoma medications. What would be our choice? I think there we will definitely think of tubes. So decide how to proceed by weighing the risks and benefits of the patient sitting in front of us to help that sick eye. There is no one rule for all. There is no one size that fits all. But if a patient sits in front of us where we have the option of doing either a tube or a trap, I think that in our present situation in India, we would still opt for a trap. And that is the more popular surgery till now. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So that was a very... So that was an excellent talk uh, regarding the traps and tubes. Uh, the controversy still remains because ma'am has left the floor open that, you know, let the uh, choice be made on the merit of the particular patient. But in the Indian scenario, like ma'am pointed out, considering the economic consideration as well as uh, the availability of the devices, probably traps are still there. It is still the gold standard and it's here to stay. So any, any questions from the audience or any comments from any of the panelists? Tubes there. Still traps are the first choice. Like how you said, we decide based on the condition of the patient. Any patient which has already had a retrap. Uh, one night patient with high pressure, already had a PK, angle abnormalities, multiple PAS, multiple surgeries, retinal surgery already done, uh, new vascularization probably suspicious um, because of the posture segment. These are the indications they go directly for a, tra for a tube. Otherwise, traps are still our first preference. So what is the tube that you usually use? Amit or Am Amit? Amit, Amit, So, and... Uh, I have a yeah. question like... Uh, uh, with a failed trap, what will be your choice? Another trap or a tube? It depends on what type of trap it is. If it's something with a secondary glaucoma where I have already tried with a trap, I would go in for a tube. Or say it's an NVG where they have put in intracamerals and we have got rid of the NVIs for the time being, maybe I would think of a tube. But if it's a plain and simple case of glaucoma where I have failed with one trap, I usually opt to do it nasally so that I have space for two more traps superiorly, I would definitely go in for a second trap. It all depends on why the first trap has failed. Mm -hmm. So a uh, question for Manishda, because I know Manishda loves AGVs. So uh, if a Ahmed glaucoma valve fails, do you go for a second valve or do you try to salvage the bleb, like in a bleb needling? Have you ever tried that? You I have tried bleb needling, but uh, they don't work for long term. Like short term is fine. In AGB patients. Yeah. Bleb, patients bleb needling in AGB or revision of the bleb in a valve. A revision of bleb, I personally have never tried in an AGB patient, but bleb needling I have tried in a few cases. It gives you a short term IP control, but then over time again the cyst form and the pressure increases. So when the AGB fail, a second AGB is generally a better option. Of late I am considering using a non walled in a case where the first one is a walled and second one can be a non walled maybe gives you a, and generally we know that non wall tends to give you a better IP control, although the surgical time is more, takes more time to start working, but gives you a better IP control. That cyclophotocoagulation is again an option if you can do a limited in a step up approach, maybe do an anti-degree and then again repeat it again. Uh, after. Have, have, has anybody tried the endo cyclophotocoagulation? Because now it's available. I'd love to try if I have it, but I don't have it. But I had one patient where post penetrating keratoplasty and AGV was done, it failed. Now, in that case, we were totally lost of all the options. So I referred the patient to Bangalore, to Dr. Gauri, who is having. And she did it, and, and the patient is doing well. Because I, I've also referred a few patients to LV Prasad, and mm. they've done an endocyclo, and they are doing well. well. We, so we had a we demo had a machine for some time. I, we in Barakpur 
Aurijit has done a couple of cases I have done. The procedure seems to be pretty simple. Now, mm. unless you're doing it regularly, the I procedure the, is uh, very quite... And, uh, and regarding uh, blab revision in case of trap, do you go for the external conventional approach or like uh, Dr. Dipanjal Pal is trying uh, the the other one where you go in through the anterior mm -hmm. chamber and then you know emerge through the ostium internal outside. You're saying internal bleb yeah. uh, Do you think that that probably is a better, less invasive way to go? I personally feel that uh, if it is a late attempt, then it is not better to go internally. Internal okay. revision helps when uh, for some reason or the other we have not established the fistula well. Somehow everything is looking fine. You have done a fantastic trap. Everything is looking fine, but the blab is not forming for reasons unknown to you. And it is, it is getting clogged some, some, somewhere. Just to establish the flow, the internal helps really well. It is very fast and it is not going to produce any sort of you know, extra blood in your blab. That is. But if you attempt it late, maybe after six months, maybe after two years, but there, are, there is a recent publication where they have tried an internal uh, blab revision. Uh, revision seven years after the primary surgery and they have showed good results. I am not very con convinced with my approach. And uh, one point I'd like to make, uh, uh, Ajit, yes, yes regarding yes. this, uh, will you often have this concept that post-AGV we can't, or a post bar where we can't do a trap, but there have been cases where we have done AGV and it has failed, and we can see that maybe nasally you can still have some conjunctiva, and we have tried trap, and luckily it has worked. So that also can be an option at times. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks to all the speakers and special thanks to Sir for uh, giving us the keynote lecture as well as giving a lot of insight into something which is being done in Brunei, which we were not aware of. Thank you so much. Thanks thank to you, each and everybody. Thank you, uh, so we conclude this talk. Thanks. thanks a lot for the audience for coming yes. in early. Thank you, thank you everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That thank was thank a you so big encouragement. Yeah. Active participation.